Bill Ackman is here. I don't know if Bill, Bill, I know watched that video. I don't know if you just got a chance to see it just now. Uh, we, of course, are going to get to Herbalife uh, in just a moment. That was the John Oliver clip. I, lo I love John Oliver. He's the greatest man in, in, ever. Uh, <laughs> uh, as long as you're not on the other end of, of John Oliver. Um, I wanted to talk politics before we even get into anything. We were talking to Lloyd just before about uh, what some people are calling the Trump rally. I, I'm curious, you woke up on Wednesday morning as an investor, mm -hmm. and you thought what? I, I woke up extremely bullish on Trump, believe it or not. And uh, my thinking is as follows. This is the greatest, the United States is the greatest business in the world, and it's been undermanaged for a very long period of time. We now have a businessman in the president's, you know, as the president, and the, he has power because Republicans control Congress, Republicans control the Senate, he's going to launch a major infrastructure program, he's going to you know, take uh, corporate taxes down to a sensible level, level and get rid of loopholes, he's going to get a lot done, and nothing has gotten done in, you know, a very long period of time. And if you're an activist investor, you want someone to come in, take over, and get things that need to get done, done. And I think that's extremely bullish for growth in the United States. And uh, he's also gonna, you know, I think he's, he, if you look at his financial advisors, they're not your typical presidential financial advisors. They're business people. And the United States is the biggest business in the world. It deserves to be run by a business person. And I think he will attract the best and brightest to help him grow the country. So I think it's very bullish from an investor point of view, I think he's gonna reduce regulation, he's gonna get rid of the sclerotic Washington, D.C. I think that's gonna increase uh, the bullishness of CEOs, and I think that's why the stock market's going up. I'm almost on the floor hearing you say this. <laughs> I really mean it. Only because I think the last time I talked to you, you were supporting Hillary Clinton. No, it's not true. Not true. I've, been, I've supported Mike Bloomberg. I worked really hard to get Bloomberg elected. Uh, first, I've tried to run, I get him to run, and uh, for the same reasons. Right? I, thought, I thought Bloomberg would be a better candidate for, you know, he's a better, closer match for me on social issues and Supreme Court issues and some other things. But, you know, I've, I've said for years that if we could actually have a business person run the country, that would be a, a wonderful thing for America. So I think, first of all, I, I, I had one of the great meetings of all time with Donald Trump about 20-something years ago. I'll never forget that one. But I, I'd take the rest of this panel to tell you about that meeting. But it was Tell us about that meeting. <laughs> um, it was just a great meeting. Um, <laughs> Bad idea. Just but here's hint, what I can hint. So I've, I spent an hour and a half with Donald Trump 20-something years ago about Rockefeller Center, because we were a big shareholder of a company called Rockefeller Center Properties, and he had an idea, and we wanted to work on it together, and ultimately it didn't work out, but I, I got to, I met him then. And then I saw him at a wedding maybe a number of years ago, but I, I know Ivanka a lot better than I know Donald Trump, and I've been a big fan of hers, and I think she, my most bullish argument I can make for Donald Trump is if he produced, you know, it's hard to produce children of that kind of quality, and I think that speaks, uh, obviously, to him. Uh, so, you know, I woke up bullish about America, and you can be, you can say what you want about, you know, some personal qualities, issues, et cetera, but I, I, I believe in the what, American can people. Can we just American... talk about the transformation of your, of your thinking on this? Because I, I don't remember you thinking this way before. Uh, I woke up in the morning. No, I know, <laughs> on Wednesday morning you woke up in the morning, but I Look, my know... concern about Donald Trump was volatility. My concern was, who knows what he's going to do, right? And then I woke up and I said, you know what? This guy just became president of the United States. This is going to be his legacy. Does he want to screw it up? No, he wants to be the greatest president the country's ever had. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, Ronald Reagan getting elected, and people said the guy was a clown, he was an actor, he didn't know anything. And we look back, people think Ronald Reagan is one of the greatest presidents we've had. Now, this is a guy who knows how to build things, get them done on time and on budget. And by the way, that skill is very useful when you're going to spend a trillion dollars on fixing the infrastructure of the country. And when you're going to, but look, the American people are very wise. And the American people voted not only to put Donald Trump uh, in the presidential seat, but to, to keep control of the Congress and the Senate uh, in the hands of the Republicans, which means the president can be effective. And we've not had opportunity in a very, very long period of time. And I think that's very bullish uh, for growth. And uh, you know, a lot of things that should have happened haven't happened for many years. Corporate tax reform is something that's been talked about forever. It's probably the single biggest thing we can do to drive growth in the country and to prevent you know, companies going to Ireland and you know, Luxembourg and, and wherever so else. So what did you do on Wednesday morning in the market? 
Uh, nothing. <laughs> we, we already own what we own, so I, we, nothing. I didn't, I'm not Carl Icahn. Carl, I give Carl credit. He apparently, he left the Trump rally at 10 to go trade, you know. Uh, apparently invested a billion dollars. Index futures. That's not really what we do. But I, I you know, I think it's very good for uh, the companies that we own. So we were, we already, we're, we're, we're long America. And so I have John Oliver to take care of Herbalife. and have Donald Trump to take care of the rest of the portfolio. I'm done. <laughs> okay, well, we got to talk about a lot. We're going to talk about the names. I want to talk names. I want to talk Herbalife and Valiant and Chipotle and uh, Fannie and Freddie. But I want to ask you before we do that just about activist investing. And the, the, the theme here is playing for the long term. And we had a number of CEOs uh, join us on the stage today mm -hmm. uh, where we talked about activists and activism. And I would mention your name in some instances. They all, by the way, send their uh, best and their love. Okay. Um, <laughs> Indra Nui was here. And uh, she said this about activist investing. She said, don't try to make CEOs look like fools and use the media constructively because shaming CEOs doesn't help. If you run a company, a real company, you wouldn't be saying this. I think asset creators get the short end of the stick. They don't get enough credit and support. Asset managers and manipulators get all of the attention. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? I think she's entirely right. Uh, you know, if you look at what we do, and again, what. One of the things you learn from the success of Donald Trump is the, you know, the media here has to feel pretty embarrassed about the election and how they, they called the election. I've learned not to trust the media, unfortunately. You can't believe what you read in the newspaper. So that, perhaps, perception by Indra. This is tough for me to sit here like this, <laughs> but. Look, if I, if I were a paid guest, I'd have to be more polite, right? I'm, I'm here for free. <laughs> um, so and who is using whom? Let me just be really clear. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I have a lot of respect for engineering, uh, but if you look at what we do, okay, we are not uh, manipulators, gatherers, we're business builders. You know, we, we stepped into Canadian Pacific in, you know, summer of 2011, it was the worst run railroad in North America. We recruited uh, the best CEO in the railroad industry. The shareholders were very kindly, after the board resisted, gave us control of the company. We controlled the second largest railroad in Canada. We put him in the seat, and he built the most profitable railroad in North America over a four or five year period of time. Uh, became had the best on-time performance. They reduced delivery times. They, you know, this is a mean, meaningful part of the infrastructure of Canada, right? You look at Sefi Gassemi at Air Products. What he's done, he took the least profitable industrial gas company over the last three years and made it the most profitable. And by the way, we're still a shareholder. You look at what we did at General Growth. This was a company. The stock was at 34 cents. We joined the board. We took the company through bankruptcy. All the bondholders got their money back. Power Plus accrued. Same with all the mortgage holders. All the employees kept their jobs. We recruited a new management team. We put a new board in. The stock went from 34 cents. The pieces today trade for $44 a share. We still own the pieces. We still own the Howard Hughes Corporation. Here we took all the development assets out of Howard Hughes, you know, land, all kinds of property that were not, were not being built. We put in David Weinreb and Grant Hurlitz, people that no one had ever heard of them. Okay, And they took that company and they built a remarkable publicly traded real estate development company for a company that, that was worth zero. So we're, we're long-term investors, we're business builders, we recruit the best management teams in the world. Uh, we don't all get them right. You know, we recruited Ron Johnson into JCPenney. This was not financial engineering. This was taking a guy who built the Apple retail store chain, the most successful, most profitable retail st store chain in the world, uh, a guy who had worked at Target for 10 years and at Mervyn's and wanted to reinvent the department store, and he gave it the college try and it didn't work. <clears throat> but none of these things are about, you know, apparently Howard Schultz you know, I really don't know. He still has, he was always saying very negative things about JCPenney. What do we do? We recruited the CEO. Which he said here. Yeah, I yes, heard, I heard, heard that he had okay. said that. We recruited the CEO, very talented guy, great track record, and didn't work. You know, that's not, that's okay, right? But none of these things are leverage recaps and massive buybacks and, you know, let's go pay a huge dividend and leave the company dry. Canadian Pacific increased their CapEx spending from 700 million to a billion and a half the year after we took control of the company. So we are, we are business builders, and perhaps there's some activists that are not. I, I don't know many that, are, that act that way. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this, though. You have had a tough year. Yes. It is fair to say. Yes. Uh, you had $20 billion under management yes. back in March of 2015. Yes. Down now to about 11.4. Something like that, yes. Um, I think, is, I don't know if William Cohen's here. He wrote an article called, Is Bill Ackman Toast? I love articles like that. Uh -huh. It motivates me every day. And by the way, to give you a sense of the fraudulence of the press, and I, I like Bill, he's a good guy, the opening, the opening anecdote in this story is about a match where I play tennis with John McEnroe. Mm -hmm. And in reality, what the, what the article says is, I almost hit John McEnroe with an overhead, 
And then he was incredibly polite to me for the rest of the match, even though I never even apologized. That's what the article says. Here are the facts. I hit John McEnroe with an overhead. Okay, I apologize profusely. John McEnroe spent the rest of the match trying to hit me with the ball. Okay, <laughs> which story sounds more accurate, knowing John McEnroe? Okay, anyway. The rest uh, of the we'll piece. do Q&A and maybe get to William in just a minute. Uh, and he can, he can take this and one And I like on. John McEnroe. Good tennis um, player. But let's just talk about some of the, the companies that have struggled and try to understand the way you're thinking about them now. We've had one problem. What is that problem? That problem is Valiant, pharmaceuticals, and the mistake we made is for the first time we bought a company that had an incredibly successful track record. There was already an activist on the board of directors. There was a CEO who had done an excellent job, and we thought we could be a passive investor. And we got our head ripped off. And in the last seven or eight months, we went back to what we do, which is try, you know, we, Valiant, at, when we joined the board, was a classic Pershing Square investment. Valiant, when we made the investment at $190 a share as a passive investor, really uh, is not a, the kind of thing that we should be doing. For what is, is there a path back on Valiant for you? Sure, so uh, path back. Uh, you know, we're not gonna get to $190 a share very quickly, uh, but I think the- Ever? Uh, ever is too long a period of time. There's a, there are real businesses here, and, and when I talk about what the CEO is doing. So let's talk about what we've done, and then we can talk about what the CEO has done. So uh, I joined the board in March, along with Steve Fraden, our, our vice chairman, uh, brilliant uh, lawyer, and the company was on, a, on its way to bankruptcy. Uh, over the first weekend on the board, uh, we convinced the rest of the board that Mike had to go. Uh, Mike, I, I was the guy the board asked to call him to tell him he was fired, basically. Uh, we also had to get a 10K filed, and Steve worked with some combination of lawyers and the accountants to make sure that that worked. We made a deal with the banks, working with the company's uh, treasurer uh, to extend the maturity of, or get some defaults waived. I mean, mm -hmm. really a, a mess. Uh, and then we worked hard with the board to recruit a new CEO, a guy named Joe Papa, who I think is uh, exactly the right kind of person for something like this. And then Joe, since he's been there, has recruited a CFO, uh, in this case from uh, Zoetis, a company that we have been an investor in. Uh, a great general counsel, you know, he's building out uh, a management team, and he's announced a strategy, and the strategy is we're gonna sell non-core assets, you know, about $8 billion of assets have been identified. Uh, we're gonna use those, that money to pay down debt, and we're gonna fix the operations of the business, and uh, we'll probably at some point rename the company when we made some progress. Uh, but what's, what will be left uh, is uh, some really great businesses. Uh, there's Bausch and Lomb. You know, if you think about the contact lens business, this is one of the great businesses of the world. My guess is if you wear contact lenses, you very rarely switch. Uh, and you know, they've got very high margins. It's a great business. They've got something called branded generics, which is like Advil in Mexico. Right. You know, people trust these kind of brands. There's no very little pharmaceutical risk. They have a product called CeraVe. Your skin looks very nice. My guess is you use CeraVe on your face. Thank you. Um, great product. It's like Neutrogena, growing very quickly in Valiant. And so, so it's a collection of different businesses, and uh, you know, they've been disrupted in a very dramatic way. Morale has obviously been hit by employees losing their net worth as the stock price declined. But I think Joe is putting in place the right team, and we'll have a balance sheet. What, what did you disrupt. miss? I mean, some people have called this the Enron of pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. As an investor, and, and you're somebody who historically has tried to find the Enrons, and instead of buying, going long, you have gone short. The answer is, we got to know Valiant over the course of 2014 in a pretty intimate way, which gave us the confidence to invest in the company in 2015. And it turns out that the business changed very dramatically in 2015. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, the events that took down Valiant, almost all of them took place in 2015, and we were not aware of them at the time they were taking place. And I'll give you a few examples. So one of the things that gave us confidence in investing in Valiant was Mike Pearson's track record for allocating capital. Uh, and the best evidence of that we had was firsthand. I, I spent a year working with Mike on the Allergan transaction. Mm -hmm. And at the very end, in October, Mike had a decision to make. Do I raise my bid to get the deal, or do I walk and let activists get the deal? Our view was he should raise his, raise his bid. And if he raised his bid, we, the combination was incredibly strategic. We thought it would be a great transaction. And we thought the returns for shareholders would be fantastic. Mike said, Bill, you know what? It's just not a good enough deal for me. Uh, my standards are higher. I'll let activists buy the company. And I was like, wow, this is real discipline. So when uh, Valiant bought Salix uh, just six months later and spent the biggest deal they had done in their history, I believed on the basis of his passing on Allergan that this was a spectacular deal. Because you know, why would he pass on a deal I thought was 
very great for this one. Well, it turns out he significantly overpaid uh, for Salix. What else did he do in, in 2015? He bought a couple of drugs. He marked the price up overnight, 5 and 10x, attracting congressional scrutiny. Uh, they did this, this Philidor entity, which you know, didn't exist at the time. We did due diligence on the company in 2014. Grew from 1% of revenues in the fourth quarter of 2014 to 7% of the revenues of the company. And in that case, they made a deal to buy control of the entity. They consolidated it, but they never disclosed it. Right. And they gave the management this huge economic incentive to drive prescription sales. And I still don't know the facts at this point because they're still under investigation, but apparently some compliance and other violations took place as these uh, entrepreneurs were incentivized to deliver results for Valiant. Those three events, uh, plus a minor accounting, half a percent of revenue accounting, revenue uh, recognition issue from one quarter to the next, were all sort of disclosed in October of, uh, of last year, and the company went dark and didn't respond. The short sellers had the stage. And, uh, and that basically is what destroyed the company. But if the, you know, it's, it's really kind of a remarkable thing. So what do we miss? We miss that someone with a superb track record of making acquisitions could do something, you know, I mean, Mike Pearson went crazy, in my opinion. And uh, part of that, I think, is he worked very closely with Howard Schiller, his partner, up until Howard effectively retired at the end of 2014. And Mike was always the incredibly aggressive guy, and, and perhaps, not having that balance of power, he just pushed things too far. Do you think anything criminal took place? I don't know. I don't know. And did you take any solace throughout this that Value Act, another big activist fund, was involved in this? I did. Uh, we had an activist in the boardroom. They owned a huge amount of stock. You know, you would assume they would uh, act in their best interests. Um, you know, I, perhaps I should have took note when they sold a billion dollars of stock over the summer. Um, you know, that, uh, so it was unfortunate. And, you know, I thought, I, we always like, you know, when we invest in a company, we want there to be a large shareholder in the boardroom. And Value Acts had a good track record, and they were on the board of this company for six or seven years. They hired Pearson. They designed his right. incentive compensation. I think they're good people. And that, that was comforting to us. So, you know, this will be one for the business school case studies. Um, but, you know, the mistakes we made is we paid a full price for the existing assets and bet on management's track record to continue. Uh, and... We relied on others to be our eyes and ears in the boardroom. And I think that was our mistake. What about Chipotle? So Chipotle, we're back to core Pershing Square kind of investments. So instead of investing in Chipotle when they're doing extremely well in the stock 730, we wait for an otherwise great company with a great brand to make a mistake and for people to lose confidence in the company and the management of the board. And that's when we can be most effective. And we, you know, we've been very effective in fast food. You know, uh, first investment in fast food was Wendy's, doubled our money. Uh, McDonald's, similar kind of uh, Involved term. Burger King at one point. Burger King, we're still a major shareholder. It's now called Restaurant Brands. We made three and a half times our money uh, with that company. So it's a space we know well. It's a simple, predictable, free cash flow generative uh, business. Uh, it's an unlevered company with a strong balance sheet. They own all their stores, which is very important because they can, when you have a problem, it's easier to fix it if you control uh, the store base. And it's the first uh, well, I eat on a regular basis at Chipotle. I eat on a less regular basis at the other fast food companies we've invested in. So I like the food. I think it's healthy. I think it's good for America. I think they've got a sustainable moat around their business. And I think the food safety issues they've had, uh, I think they've addressed properly. And it's a matter of time before the customer comes back. OK, let's talk about Herbalife. Because you said there was just one problem. Yeah. yeah. And I don't you said it was Herbalife a problem. You don't consider Herbalife a problem. It's been a media problem. But I know, I know the ultimate outcome, right? So. I have an enormous stomach for volatility. This, this stock has had some volatility. Uh, to say the least. Here are the facts as they stand now. What you have is a company whose business is declining, is deteriorating. Uh, you know, they were supposed to earn something like eight bucks in 2017. Uh, know, if you look at the analyst models of just a couple years ago, their now guidance is you know, 460 to five bucks, and they're adding back a whole bunch of expenses that we think are not add backs. So I think they're gonna have regulatory and defending against the short seller expenses forever until right. the company is gone. Um, and the CEO just quit you know, last week. That's never a good sign. Uh, the FTC found them to be a pyramid scheme, except they didn't use the word pyramid scheme. But if you look at the FTC complaint and the findings and compare them to the complaint and findings and other companies that are called pyramid schemes, they're effectively identical. The FTC, the terms, the injunctive relief of the FTC settlement take effect beginning in May. So they've got a, cl a cliff uh, coming. 
And actually, I would not underestimate uh, Mr. Oliver's 32-minute uh, takedown of the company, which everyone has to watch, everyone in the room, you have to watch. And then after you've watched the entire thing, you have to send it to 10 of your friends with the instructions to send it to 10 of their friends with the instructions to send it to 10 of their friends, okay? And a few more levels, we've covered the globe. Um, but the point here is Herbalife loses 2 million distributors a year who quit because they lose money, and they have to recruit 2 million to replace them. How hard is that going to be when this, you know, this, the John Oliver video has been watched 5 million times in English, and they translate it in Spanish, and it's been watched a couple million times in Spanish, um, but it's, uh, you know, that will make it, that will destroy the confidence of the distributors, and this is a con game, right. and once the confidence is gone, it's gone. And yet your, your other Trump supporter and friend, Carl Icahn, keeps buying. He, yes. Explain that. One, I love Carl. Um, two, he's charming. Three, he's a smart investor. Uh, but, you know, if I were his friend or whatever you want to call it, if a family member, I would, I would take him away from the trading desk on this one. And uh, Do you wish, though, that you hadn't said some of the, the things early? I mean, if you, could, if you could go back and redo Herbalife, Mm -hmm. Given the amount of press attention that it got, yes. given the, the view that you said it was going to go to zero. Yes. It's going to go to zero. That's true. Would, would have you done anything differently? Yes. I would have shorted the same amount of stock. I would have put together a package. I would have walked over to late night uh, TV. I would have handed it to John Oliver. And I would have had him make the presentation. Done. Well, seriously. I mean, the, the, there is no upside to be a public, a so-called active activist short seller, because the, the, uh, the shareholders hate you, the management hates you, there's always a risk that Carl Icahn will step in and buy 20% of the company, and every day say it's a great business. Uh, you're just better off staying in the shadows and letting other people do the work. And I got two so it's more. it's my last, I mean, maybe this is bad for CNBC, but it's my last public short. It's your last. Short, what I do next time in all seriousness, we find another short like this one, and do the work, we're gonna sit down with the SEC, and we're gonna let them just run it out. It's just not worth the opprobrium that comes with going after a company, even if, in this case, as I believe, this company's causing enormous economic harm to very vulnerable populations, and actually being a big consumer, was letting the world know about the business, I thought we were doing good for society. But unfortunately, when there's a money element involved, right. you know, no one will you know, believe you. I want to go to the audience, but I have two questions. One about Fannie and Freddie, and the under, other about Mondelez. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been speculation that 3G um, is putting together a fund. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of speculation that ultimately that fund, 3G of course, Heinz Kraft, you know them well, will ultimately try to buy Mondelez. What do you think of that? I think if I said anything, 3G would get angry at me. And I like them. I want to, I want to keep as many friends as I can. <laughs> Should we take a wink and a nod that something is going on then? No, I don't know. I don't know what, whether they're, I don't know if they're raising fund, what, they're, what they plan to do with it, and the last thing they would want to do is let other people know. We will leave that there. Um, Fannie and Freddie. Yes. You have been talking about Fannie and Freddie for a very long time. Yes. Um, and dare I say, not getting a lot of traction on the issue. With a new president in office. Yes. Uh, what do you think is going to happen? I think Fannie and Freddie are going to get resolved in the first 12 months of the, this new administration. And I'm looking forward to having my second meeting with Donald Trump and negotiating a deal. And what is that deal? I think the deal is that the government, if you look at the, the bailout of Fannie Freddie, it looked like the bailout of all the other banks. Think Citigroup. Government injects preferred stock, gets warrants, uh, helps build the capital of the enterprise, uh, tells Citigroup, you know what, we're going to require you to build your capital base to a certain level. Uh, we're going to limit y your activities to only the safest stuff. Uh, and then we're going to, once your capital base gets to a sufficient level, and you don't need us anymore, we're going to either convert our preferred into common, or we're going to uh, you know, sell our preferred in the marketplace or allow you to refinance us. That is the model that was used to bail out AIG and every other company in America, except for one, which is, or except for two, uh, Fannie and Freddie. And so $185 billion of capital were injected into, capital was injected into Fannie and Freddie. Uh, Fannie and Freddie had gotten back, or the government's gotten back 265 or $70 billion uh, the, uh, under the original deal, Fannie Freddie still owned still owned a little bit more because it was a 10% interest factor, more than twice what they charged anyone else, but fine. We've got to pay back the remaining interest. It might be another $25 billion. 
But what has to happen here is Fannie and Freddie should be limited to the core business they were set up to do, which is to guarantee first mortgages on middle class housing to credit worthy borrowers. And that's a safe business, it's a utility life business, utility like business. And if they're limited, uh, you know, guardrails around the business, and they have sufficient capital to withstand the great flood, you know, what Jamie Dimon would call a fortress uh, balance sheet, and they're watched very, very carefully, you have businesses that will grow in value over a very long period of time. The taxpayer owns 79.9% of these two companies. The taxpayer gets 35% of the taxable income, because the, the taxing power, so 87% of this thing is owned by the taxpayer. But the taxpayer can't get that profit and the value of the equity without allowing the private, or the public shareholders to get their share. And so I think that's how it gets resolved. There's all kinds of litigation going on. Litigation's a bit of the stick and it is a threat to the government. Um, but the right answer here is a, a consensually negotiated deal where you have a commercial counterparty to negotiate with. Uh, the Obama administration put in place the so-called net worth sweep that has expropriated 100% of the profits of these institutions forever. That was an illegal act. There's no way the Obama administration was going to reverse that. And that's why we didn't even try. You know, I, I have not been lobbying the halls of, of DC to try to get that reversed. My theory was whoever the next president was, would be able to sit down with someone and negotiate something sensible. That's how I think this thing gets resolved and I couldn't imagine a better right. person to negotiate with than someone who knows something about real estate. Uh, let's go to the audience and get some microphones because uh, I know there's a lot of people that have uh, questions and then I have one final one for you. Um, let's go right there. Hi, Alex yes. Stevenson, uh, New York Times, oh. member of the Fraudulent Press. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so Much kinder words than Mr. Trump has used, or President Trump has used, yes. So it's, it, it's been a difficult uh, year and a bit for you. Last year you were down 20%. Uh, so far this year you're down 20%. You had an investor call today where you updated everybody. You mm. normally take calls. Uh, you didn't take any questions from investors. So what happened? Oh, so... We get the questions in advance, and what we did is we tried to answer all the questions in the presentation we made, and we're supposed to give normally a one-hour conference call. At an hour 15 in, we ended the call. But we, any of our investors who have questions are free to call us at any time. Was there any particularly good question you didn't get a chance to answer? Not that I'm aware of. I like good questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll go quick. We've got a question there, and then we'll go there. Uh, my name is Adam Wines, I'm an MBA student at Fordham University. Uh, I've heard you say before that when you started your MBA program, you wanted to get into investing, but there wasn't necessarily classes or a major for that. And um, I'm wondering, a two-part question. First, what did, what did you do afterwards in order to, uh, what industry would give you the best uh, skills to get into a position you're in now? And, and the second part of that is with the rise of quantitative hedge funds and where do you see, you know, good old-fashioned financial statement analysis and reading thousands of pages of annual reports and 300-page uh, slide PowerPoints like you're so famous for and, and really getting into it rather than these quantitative hedge funds? Thank you. Sure. So I think the best uh, thing, in the investing business, you can learn by reading. You know, read everything Warren Buffett's ever written. Watch every YouTube video he's ever appeared in. Uh, that's a great way to learn uh, about investing. Uh, but inve Investing is more than just, the, the way to really understand investing is to understand a business. And one of the most important skills you need as an investor is dis distinguishing between a great business, a good business, a fair business, and a bad business. And one way to get a sense of the quality of a business is go to work for one. So the recommendation I give to people graduating from business schools these days is this is the greatest time in, in history to work for a startup. There are lots of incredibly interesting businesses being formed if you can be one of the early employees, you're going to learn a lot about how a business works, how to make payroll, how to market your product, how to design something. And those skills, I think, are invaluable. First of all, you might even find it really interesting. You might have joined the next Facebook, so that's one thing. Even if the business fails, you'll learn a ton from that. I think that's the best experience you can get, ultimately, to be a good fundamental investor. In terms of the future of fundamental investing, uh, I don't think everyone can be a passive investor, and I don't think everyone can be a quantitative uh, trader. And uh, I think there will be always... Uh, room for fundamental value investing uh, because fundamentally stocks are driven and you know, business value is driven by business fundamentals, uh, not s supply and demand for securities in the short term, not the weather on certain days and these various signals that are used by quantitative traders. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. 
but I don't think that, that even quantitative trading works unless it's, there are a lot of people making fundamental investment decisions. I think there was one more question right over here. Hi, uh, my name is Darren, and I'm from Columbia University. Um, and we've been looking at Chipotle for a while at school, and I really had like a two-part question. One is, you know, given the uh, outbreak of the virus, when do you think sales will recover? And do you have a timeline really like what quarter in the next year or so? Mm -hmm. And then my second question is, um, as an activist investor, um, unlike some of the previous um, things you looked at, like um, ham um, Wendy's or Burger King, it's not really a franchise model. So I'm curious as to what you can do as an activist investor. I know you signed a confidential agreement recently. Um, so taking that into regard, just curious. And finally, if you're open to it, what's your <laughs> price target? Okay. <laughs> um, so I don't know precisely when sales recover, but I would say they're already recovering. So you can look at the pace of sales recovery and you can form your own view. Uh, it typically takes, there's a lot of history behind fast food and I mean, pretty much every restaurant has had a food safety issue. And the key for the restaurant industry, if you've got a, lot, a large number of stores, is isolating the problem, uh, locking it down, and then informing your consumers that you've identified the problem and it's been fixed. Uh, one of the problems with Chipotle is they did not have, at the time, the systems in place to track all of these fresh ingredients, and so they couldn't figure out where the problem came from, and I think that was an issue. But even the worst cases, and you look at Jack in the Box, you know, something approaching 800 people were, got sick, 160 got permanent organ damage, and then uh, you know, four children died. It was an incredible tragedy. You know, even that business, two years later, was you know, the sales were back. And, you know, Chipotle, I think, is a pretty beloved uh, brand. I think they're doing a lot of the right things uh, to recover, and I, you know, I think that's not an unreasonable expectation for, you know, for what's your price recovery time frame. We, we we don't have a uh, target price, um, but we do think that if you own the stock at today's price, you'll make a very attractive return over time. Uh, in terms of what they need to do, I think they're already focusing on it. Obviously, governance has been has been questioned by a lot of shareholders, and I think the you know the company said publicly they're looking at uh, kind of revamping uh, the board of directors. I think that will uh, be a big positive. A lot of very successful companies, I mean, I, I look at the Valiant example. Valiant was an incredibly successful company. The stock was up 26 times or something under Mike Pearson's uh, rule, uh, management, and then they got hit with a crisis. They didn't know how to handle it. And a lot of that relates to, you know, the board experience, and, and, and people can be great at overseeing a business, at terrible at dealing with a crisis. It's a critical skill for a management team and a board, because someday one will happen. Uh, Bill, we got to go, but I have one final question myself. Please. Which is, if I was an investor in Bill Ackman, mm -hmm. playing for the long term, but I'm an activist, yes. how much time should I give you, and how should I measure your performance over the next couple of years? Sure. I think you, the way to look at us is, the question is, is Valiant an anomaly, or is there something structurally wrong with the Pershing Square? And I think if you look at the facts, uh, the vast majority of our investments, including the ones we hold today, have been successful. You know, our batting average has been remarkably high over a very, very long period of time. We went, what I would say, uh, use a football analogy, football, European football analogy, we went off-piste. We did something a little bit different. We made a passive investment, we paid a full price, we suffered the consequence. So I think if you feel comfortable that that's a one-off, um, you know, that we've already, we've already suffered pretty much all of the loss we can suffer with respect to Valiant. Uh, and, you know, at this price, we think it's cheap. You know, people, uh, Alex talked about two years, two difficult years. I mean, the answer is it's, it's been difficult from August to March, and we've been making progress. We still got a ways to go. Um, okay. But, you know, this was a extraordinary experience. And in my experience as an investor, my favorite CEO is the CEO that had a great record, made one really bad acquisition or one really bad decision. You know, new Coke, right. where they bought something, they paid the wrong price, and then uh, they've learned from it. And then you can you know, get the benefit of a good entry price. I, you can buy Pershing Square today and we're really cheap. Uh, and then you get the benefit of a, you know, the, the same management team uh, with that much more humility, that much more uh, insight uh, and experience. And, and I think that's a, you know, I think investors have learned that story over time. The humble Bill Ackman, everybody. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.